Shalom everyone and uh, today we're going to study about the life and the legacy of the Arizal. There's no way we can cover it within one lesson, not even within a hundred or a thousand. Uh, one of the greatest souls that ever walked on earth, we're going to read about it. Uh, Rabbi Azakroya was born in Jerusalem in the year 1530. Four. His father came from uh, uh, what is today, I think, Belarus, uh, Eastern Europe. He was a descendant of Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, who was also a descendant of King David. So we are talking about somebody that from his father's side, he had a legacy of thousands of years of uh, rabbis, sages, and so on. On his mother's side, she was from the uh, Jews that were expelled from Spain in 1492 and arrived to Jerusalem. Uh, he was born in, as I said, in 1534 in Jerusalem. And when he was eight years old, his father passed away. His mother couldn't make a living and finally she had to go to uh, Cairo, Egypt because her, her, her brother, uh, was very rich and lived in Cairo and so Rabbi Ezekloria grew up at his uh, uncle's home, married his cousin and he was very very uh, uh, focused on studying, learning over there in Cairo till he made the move to Tzfat in Israel that was a growing community at the time and over there he spent a little bit more than the last two years of his life till he passed away at the age of 38. However, we know that his legacy, what he was teaching, changed the history of Jewish learning uh, forever. And basically he revived the study of Kabbalah in a way that did not happen since, let's say, since Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the Zohar some uh, 13 centuries earlier. Um, he reorganized the study of the Zohar, the study of Kabbalah, in a way that nobody did before, even Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, because the Zohar is written not as a textbook, it's a collection of many, many articles, mostly in Aramaic, mostly co-encoded with so many codes that it's almost impossible if you're not really a sage to get the picture. Rabbi Ezekloria taught the study in textbooks, which means he created a, a process of study that gives order. He did not write almost anything. Uh, the person that he appointed to write it down was Rabbi Chaim Vital, that was originally his family came to, uh, to uh, the Middle East from Italy, a few uh, generations uh, uh, from Calabria in it Italy. And he was living in between Damascus and Sfat. He was, when he was 29, Rabbi Chaim Vital was already one of the greatest Kabbalists in the world, which means he was a student of Kabbalah. He was already a very, very appreciated uh, persona in Tzfat. And then he met the Arizal, Rabbi Ezekloria, and uh, Rabbi Ezekloria basically revealed himself to Rabbi Chaim Vital and said, I came to this world to teach you so you can write down this teaching and spread it around the world. And I don't trust anybody else to do it as you. So uh, the teachings of Rabbi Isaac Luria, after he passed away, like we're talking about that he was teaching in Tzfat less than two years. But these teachings were very intense. The legacy left behind, as I said, revamped, recreated 
their whole, a whole new vision of the study of Kabbalah gave it a, a, a dimension of clarity that nobody had before, uh, gave it an order, uh, and he connected between the study of the uh, universe, the study of the Torah, the study of the mitzvot, the traditions, the law, everything together. And when he passed away, he simply did the job. His students spread around the world and create, went on creating the big revolution of Kabbalah. Some of them went to uh, North Africa, especially to uh, Morocco. Uh, some of them went to Europe. And the ones who went to North Africa and Middle East, they created the, the uh, Sephardic Kabbalistic revolution uh, that basically recreated a new study of Kabbalah that is called the Sephardic Kabbalah. The ones who went to Europe started an Ashkenazi, European Jewish study of Kabbalah. And basically that gave birth after a certain, uh, after two centuries into the Hasidic movement. Basically, all the, uh, the Sephardic Kabbalah and the, uh, and the uh, European Kabbalah, both of them are based on the legacy of Rabbi Ezekluria. They were copying from each other, quoting from each other, learning with each other. Uh, the meeting point was mostly in Israel, uh, although some emigrated from uh, to uh, north, you know, in between the countries, but mostly in Israel. So uh, let's start a little bit trying to understand that unique uh, person, sage, uh, holy man, that is called Rabbi Isaac Luria. Uh, people call him usually the Arizal, which is uh, initials of Ari. Ari is, means the lion, but it is initials of the words Ha'eloki Rabbeinu Yitzchak, the divine, our teacher Isaac. Ari, Zal means of blessed memory. So usually you can hear about the Ari, the holy Ari, the holy lion, okay, or Ari Zal, which is a rabbi as a glory of blessed memory. So uh, we'll start uh, with how did he look like? So uh, 1984, there was somebody was a uh, somebody was repairing his house in a tzfat, and there was a hole in the wall, and he went in and he was cleaning it, and he found a whole bunch of manuscripts, and these manuscripts, among them, there was this picture. Uh, they said in the manuscript that that was Rabbi Isaac Luria. The great Kabbalist of that generation in 1984, the Baba Sali, uh, he got the picture and it says that he had, he was a great Kabbalist, he made many miracles. He did She'elat Chalom, which means he made a meditation and a request to get the answer in his dream. And after that, he approved that that was the picture of the Arizal. So we don't know, but that's a, that's an assumption that this is the picture of the Arizal. Uh, in the writings of Rabbi Chaim Vital, as we said, the Arizal could not write. He said that the information is coming in like a flood and he has just to put so much effort to let just a little bit as a trickle, not to, so not to drown his students. So Rabbi Chaim Vital, that was his main student and the appointed scribe, wrote down uh, what is called the eight gates, uh, that, the eight gates of the wisdom of Kabbalah, that he basically wrote down what he heard from the Arizal, and this is his introduction to the beginning of it, and he says, I'll read it, I'll read it and I'll translate. Today I'm going to 
express um, uh, riddles and wonders. Every generation, the Holy Blessed Be, the, the Lord, was shining to us. By having those remnants of holiness, those souls coming to every generation to illuminate the road, the, the way. And also in our generation, we're talking about the middle of this um, uh, 16th century, Elohei HaRishonim V'Achronim, the God of the first teachers and the last ones, Lo Ishbit Goel Yisrael, He did not leave us without a Redeemer. Vayikane la'artso, vayachamol olamo, vayishlach lanu ir v'kadish min shmai anachit. He really had compassion for our, his nation and his country, and he sent us this holy man from heavens. Harav HaGadol HaEloki, the divine great teacher, HaChasid, the pious, Mori Rabbi, my teacher and my rabbi, Kvod Moreno Arav Rab Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi. Yitzchak Luria, that was his name, Yitzchak his first name, Luria his family name, that Luria is a very, very respected uh, Jewish family, and we're talking about generations of very few Jews had the last name, only the great uh, families. Ashkenazi, because his father came from uh, Germany, from the, the uh, from Europe. Male Torah Kerimon, full wisdom of the Torah, like a pomegranate, Bemikra, with the Torah, Bemishnah, with the uh, Mishnah, the Talmud, Befilpul, with learning to, to the depths, Bemidrashim, Hagadot, Maseh Bereshit, Maseh Merkava, the, the, the story of the creation, the structure of the tree of life. Baki Basichat Eilonot, he could understand the messages coming from the sound the trees are making in the wind. It's they are messages. Sichat Eilonot, he could understand birds speaking. Sichat Malachim, he understood the speech of the angels. Makir Bechokmata Patsuf, he knew the wisdom of face reading. Anizka Berashbi, Parashat Vatate Cheze, that is mentioned in the Zohar in Parashat Itro. Yodea Bechol Masei Bne Adam She Asuva She Didim Lasot. He could tell about every person whatever they did and whatever they're planning to do. Yodea Bechol Bne Adam, he could read thoughts. Read minds. Terem Yotziyum in Akoch El could read somebody's mind before when he had an idea, before he made any any move on making it happening. Yodea Atidot, he could know the futures. Vechol Advarim Ma'ovim Bechol Arts, he could see whatever is on earth. Velemash and Ixar Tamid Bashamayim, whatever was decreed in the heavens. Yodea Bechokmat Agilgul, he knew the wisdom of reincarnation. Mi Chadash, Mi Ashan, he could tell about a person what reincarnation he is. This one just came, that one is very old, many times reincarnated. Beifat Aishahu, Beizah Makom Tluya, and that person, every human being that he met, he could tell where his soul came from, the supreme uh, primordial man. And also, with the Adam, you know, Adam from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, all human souls came from Adam. Where in Adam that soul came from? Yodea Beshalevet Anir could look at the flame, the dancing of the flame of the candle, and he could tell futures from looking at it. Velavat Esh and the flame of the fire, Dvarim Niflame, wonderful things. Mr. Kelvet Sofebe he could look and see with his eyes the souls, the neshamot tzadikim arishonim v'achonim, the souls of the righteous souls from early days and from previous, uh, later days. Umitasek imayim bechokmat emid, you could summon great righteous souls and discuss with them about issues of the wisdom of Kabbalah. 
מכיר בריח אדם כל מעשיו, he could smell a person and can tell all about his doings. על דרך ההוא ינוקה פרשת בלק, like there's a story in פרשת בלק, in the Zohar, about a child that could smell somebody and he could tell if that somebody prayed that morning, did not pray that morning, and so on and so forth. וכל החוכמות הנזכרים in all kinds of wisdoms. היו אצלו כמונחים בחיקו, they were like with him, like he had it in his uh, uh, balsam. בכל עת שירצה any time he wanted. בלתי צריך להתבודד ולחקור עליהם, he did not have to uh, isolate himself and think and research. He had access to all the wisdom, all the wisdom of the universe, any time he wanted. ועיניי ראו ולא זר, and my eyes, this is Rabbi Chai Vital, my eyes saw it, not, some, but not a stranger. דברים מבהילים, scary things, לא נראו ולא נשמעו בכל הארץ, things that were never seen or heard on, the, on earth. From מימי רשב"י עליו השלום ועד עדה. Since the times of רבי שמעון בר יוחאי, till these days. וכל זה השיג, and all of that, he achieved, שלא על ידי שימוש קבלה מעשית. He did not use witchcraft or any kind of uh, powers in order to achieve it. כי איסור גדול יש בשימושם because it's really, really forbidden not recommended because it's very dangerous. So how did he get to that endless wisdom? Omnam Koza Yam Atzmo, he arrived to that wisdom by himself. Al Yedei Chasiduto Ofrishoto. By becoming such a pious, dedicated person. Achrei Tasko Yamim Veshanim Rabim after learning for days and many years. Bisfarim Chadashim Gam Yeshanim with new books, old books, in that wisdom of Kabbalah. ועליהם הוסיף חסידות ופרישות וטהרה וקדושה. And he not just learned so much, but his piety, his uh, purity, his holiness, brought him to such a spiritual level that he brought, he brought to his life Elijah the prophet. שהיה נגלה אליו תמיד, אלייש דה פרופט וול קאם טו הים אולווייז. הוא מדבר עמו פה אל פה, תיץ' הים מאוט טו מאוט, ולמדו זאת החוכמה, אני טוט הים דס וויזדום. וכמו שהראה לרבת ז"ל, it's something that happened also known to רבי אברהם בן דוד אוף פוסקירס, but that was few centuries earlier, כנ"ל בשם הרקנטי, ואף אם פסקה נבואה, and we know, there was no prophecy after the destruction of, this, of the first temple. But there is Holy Spirit that could be revealed by Elijah the prophet. That is still available. וכמו שהובא בפסוק הנביאים, על פסוק והוא דבורה אישה נביאה, when it says in the book of Judges about דבורה, that was a woman and a prophet, תנא דבר אליהו, we learn from Elijah, says, דה מדרש, מעיד עני אני עלי שמיים וארץ, הן איש או אישה, a man or a woman, אפילו עבד, even a slave or a maid, אפילו שפחה, הכל לפי מעשיו, according to their actions. If the person is pious enough, dedicated enough, pure enough, works hard enough to become holy, the Holy Spirit will dwell in. upon that person, a man or a woman, a slave or a maid. ועל דרך זה הזכירו גם כן שם. So it's not about your legacy, about your honor, it's about how pure and how holy can you bring yourself to be. ועל דרך זה הזכירו גם כן שם, הפסוק ואלה דברי דבר אחר. זה, it's, it's mentioned other places, but it is known that there's no prophecy, but there is Holy Spirit, which is a lower level, But the Holy Spirit is still available all along the generations till today, just when a person is holy enough, he can reveal the Holy Spirit. It is also mentioned in the Zohar, 
in the introduction, וזה לשונו. At that time it was not in print yet, so Rabbi Chayvital says that he read it in a manuscript, handwritten, and it says, ואנט אליהו עתיד יתגליה בסוף יומה. And it says in the introductions to the uh, Tikkuni Zohar, and you, Elijah, you, the Holy Spirit is revealing that Elijah is going to be revealed at the end of the days. And there's somebody going to be there that is going to be, uh, have the revelation of Elijah face to face. והנה מלבד החקירות והניסיונות והמופתים שראינו בינינו. And he adds, רבי חיים ויטל, and just above it, we also made his decisions of the Arizal, we, we researched. We didn't just believe whatever he said. We researched. We, we, we tested him. We saw the miracles. שראינו בינינו, we saw with our own eyes from רבי זקלוריה. הנה הדרושים והדברים עצמם אשר בחיבורי זה. But whatever you're going to read in my book, יעידון ויגידון will testify, will tell, כל רואיהם יכירו, everybody you can see them will know, כי דברים עמוקים ונפנאים אלה, that these deep and wonderful words, אין יכולת בשכל אנושי לחברה. A human brain, a human mind cannot write those things. You will read it and you realize that cannot come from human mind. אם לא בהשפעת הכוח, השפעת רוח הקודש, על ידי אליהו ז"ל. Only with the Holy Spirit together with Elijah the prophet. ולמען אל ישת לבך, אל אשר תמצא בקצת ספרי המקובלים המחברים הפיון שכלם האנושי. So that your brain won't be fooled by some some Kabbalists, that they wrote books according to their own understanding and mind, not as the Holy Spirit. So, you, in, in, so because you're not going to be fooled and misled by people who wrote according to their logic, I'm going to give you the guidance through the wisdom of the Arizal, how really to understand the study of Kabbalah. Okay, so basically he's saying amazing stuff about Rabbi Zakhlura. That was a great soul, like one time in, in a millennia that somebody like this can be revealed. This wisdom, this wisdom was revealed by as long as Rabbi Shimon was alive. ומאז ואילך נסתם חזון, from then and on, the vision, which means the ability to see the way the universe is structured in such a clarity, that has been uh, covered. כנ"ל מאותו המאמר דה פרשת ויחי דף ר' י"ז עמוד א', כאשר ראה בחזיון חולמו רבי יהודה לרשב"י. דאבה סליק על דלת גדפין מתקנן. We learn it from the Zohar of Parashat Vayechi about Rabbi Yehuda that had a dream and he saw Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai that he was flying over four wings and the Sefer Torah he made and he was holding a Torah with him. ולא שווה כל ספרי רזין אילאין ואגדתה דלא סליק לון בעדי ואמר ודאי מידי שכיב רשבי and he said, we know from the time that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai passed, passed on, the wisdom has been removed from earth. It, it did not stay. It, there was only a leftovers of the wisdom till the Arizal came to the world. וכל אחד מהחכמים היהודים בחוכמה הזאת, מאז ואילך. And each wise person who was learning Kabbalah from the time of Rabbi Shimon, היו עוסקים בה בהסתר גדול, they were dealing with it, 
only in the hiding, only by, by behind the cover. Lobit Galia, not be not they did not reveal it to others. And every wise man will reveal his achievements only to one special student, one in a generation, that he could be the one who continues the lineage of wisdom. Whatever he was teaching is only by just, uh, just by uh, points. Revealing a little bit by covering a lot of it. And this wisdom was diminishing from one generation to another till the Rambana, the Nachmanides, 13th century. He was the last of the real true Kabbalists, 13th century. And he is even flowed with him. So I'm going to bring some riddles and show and tell about some wonders. Because like every generation, the great Lord, the, world, the one of the early ones, the, the Lord of the early ones and the later ones, He was merciful towards us. The same way today in our generation, He revealed His strong arm, holy arm, and He sent us that great soul, the pious Rabbi Isaac Luria, pious as and divine, like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in his generation. So God answered our screams and prayers in this holy land, in this city which is great to God, of wise people and scribes, in the city of Tzfat. At that time, when Rabbi Ezekluria revealed himself in Tzfat, Tzfat was the Kabbalah capital in the world. It looks like the greatest sages of the whole world, in the wisdom of Kabbalah, moved to Tzfat to create the most vibrant community of that generation. It was not just studying of Kabbalah, we're talking about Rabbi uh, Yosef Kao, who was, uh, his son married Dariza's uh, daughter, that he was a great Kabbalist, but he wrote also the Shulchan Aruch, the, the code of Jewish law, that is still respected uh, till today, all over the world by Jewish communities. That's the base of Jew every study of the law. In, that was in Tzfat in the Upper Galilee, because Shteishanim Kodem Tirat Arazal, two years before the Arizal passed away, he was forced to come to Tzfat from Egypt. Al Pia Dibur, Kichen Ugad Lo Beruch HaKodesh, because he was told by the Holy Spirit that it's time for him to leave and to go back to God. And he got it in Egypt that he was ordered to go to Tzfat and to teach a little bit of his wisdom. And that's why he moved to Tzfat, because the Holy Spirit, because Elijah the prophet, told him to go to Tzfat just before he passes on. And then when he made Aliyah from Egypt, he anointed me, and I, and and he brought light into my eyes, with some introductions, true introductions to the source of the wisdom of Kabbalah. Whatever he was given, handed over, from the heavenly academy and from the Holy Blessed Be by himself, in order to revive the study of Kabbalah on earth. And all of that was from the mouth of Elijah the prophet that was revealed to him always. And Elijah the prophet gave him the permission to reveal those uh, hidden secrets. 
על התיקונים, for the תיקוני זוהר והזוהר and the זוהר himself, שלא נתגלו מימות רשבי ואילך. That the wisdom that is really in the study of the זוהר hasn't been revealed uh, and encoded since the time of רבי שמעון, as it was revealed by the Arizal. גם היה יודע חוכמת הפצובי could do face readings, פן ריידינגס, שרטוטי ידיים, פתרון חלומות and dream interpretations על אמיתתם. ובגלגולים ישנים וגם חדשים, he could tell about somebody's reincarnations for long. היה מכיר במצע אחד אדם, he could read the forehead of a person. מה מחשב, what he's thinking about, מה שחלם, what he was dreaming about. ומה פסוק קרה בעליית נשמתו לגן עדן בלילה, and what kind of a verse he should read before he goes to sleep. So he goes up to the Garden of Eden. Vaya melamed perush shorosh nishmodo, he could teach every person the root of the, his or her soul. Vaya koro be mitzcho, and he would read in his forehead all the, the, uh, all the uh, accom- spiritual accomplishments and the transgressions that a person had in mind, that he committed. והיה נותן לכל אחד ואחד תיקון, he could give every person a תיקון, a correction. Which means, he knew the recipes, what should the person do in order to correct any kind of transgression that blemished that person's soul. וכפי הבחינה המיוחדת, and according to the special aspect of the soul of that person, and, that, and the connection of his soul, to Adam. He could read the holy book and he would know where there are mistakes, you know, when the scribes co- copy, sometimes they make mistakes. He could tell how the book was written and where the mistakes are. If he didn't want people to see him, He could flash light into their eyes, so they become temporarily blind and they couldn't see anything. He could tell all what the friends were studying somewhere else. He could tell what did they study. He was full of piety. Um, he was really, had a very nice behavior. Politeness, humility, anava, irat Hashem, the awe of God, avat Hashem, the love of God, irat cheto, the, the, the awe of sins. Kol midot tovot, he had all the great traits of uh, the most amazing of being, masim tovim, and good deeds. Vechol zayi ayodea bechol etu vechol shah verega, vechol achokhmot ayelet tamidu monachim bechiko. Venai rau velo zar, vechol zayi sigmer of chasiduto, frishuto, he repeats stuff that he said. חי תסקו ימים רבים בספרים ישנים במחדשים בחוכמה זו. ועליהם הוסיף חסידות ופרישות וטהרה וקדושה, וזהו הביאו לידי רוח הקודש. דריזה lived in צפת, as we said, for two years. Uh, there was a place, a synagogue. He used to come to study, to pray. Uh, till his time, that synagogue was called the synagogue of Elijah the, Pro, the, the Pro, Elijah the Prophet. But after Rabbi Ezekiel passed away, the synagogue was called the Arizal Synagogue. Okay? He was, the synagogue was built around the 13th century. So it was already a 200 years old synagogue when the Arizal came, uh, 300 years old, when he came to Tzfat. So it is a very ancient synagogue. Uh, that's how the synagogue looked in uh, 1911, in Tzfat. Uh, this synagogue is watching over the uh, holy cemetery of Tzfat. And by the way, till today, I think, the same families who ran the synagogue 500 years ago, in the time of the Arizal, they're still, their descendants are still running that synagogue till today, 500 years later. Okay, whoever thought the Jews came to uh, Israel only in the uh, last century, we're talking about this synagogue was established in the 13th century, and the same families are running it till today. Uh, 
that's feel like no that's a around 2000 and around the year 2005 I think uh, they renovated or restored the walls of the synagogue so that's how it looks like today that's how the synagogue looks the uh, looks uh, today uh, also in the inside you see the three arcs inside and that's how it looked in 1995 before the restoration uh, this you can see 1991 the grave of rabbi as gloria with the lantern just watching the sunset over rabbi shimon's tomb uh, that's very important to know because Rabbi Shimon, you see that the, the two peaks just where the sunset is, this is Mount Meiron, and just a little bit lower than two peaks, that's where Rabbi Shimon uh, is buried, just facing uh, the Ariza, Rabbi Isaac Luria's grave. Uh, this is another picture, you see the two peaks in behind the, uh, uh, we're talking about Tzfat is over 800 meters above sea level, Inside the synagogue of the Arizal, you can see there is a little tiny room in which Rabbi Isaac Luria was studying. And the legend says that's where he was studying with Elijah the prophet. Okay, so uh, today people come to the synagogue and go into that room to light candles and to connect to the very, very intense holiness you could feel in that room that all of that great teachings have, has been revealed. Remember this teaching today, there's no real study of Kabbalah that is not based on what is called the Lurianic Kabbalah, the teachings of Rabbi Yaza Gloria. Uh, it's so broad, it's so intense, it's so deep, it's so organized that basically it covers all walks of life, tradition, the creation of the universe, we're going to go into it. Oh, that's another uh, picture of the tomb uh, later on because a lot of stuff was added. So you see on the uh, top left, that's the Ari's tomb. That's how it looks from another aspect. And this is the Ashkenazi synagogue of the Tzfat, of the Arizal. The two synagogues called the Arizal. The one he prayed and studied, that's the Sephardic are praying over there. This one was built in the place he was praying, uh, welcoming the Shabbat. And later on, the synagogue was built over there, and that's Ashkenazi uh, community is praying over there. Okay? It's very similar, by the way, to the first one, the Sephardi. That's a Sephardi. Okay? That's also the Sephardi from the tower. It's a tower that people bring the Torah over there to read. Now we're coming to something also very important, the most important thing. After Rabbi Isaac Luria passed away, he left his legacy to Rabbi Chaim Vital, and Rabbi Chaim Vital wrote it down on a legendary 600 pages. I've seen them with my eyes. I couldn't sleep for three days after that. The touching, it's, the energy is intense. And it's called, those 600 pages are called the Eighth Gates. The Eight Gates. And these gates are divided into a few uh, topics, not like the Zohar. Each gate is describing one topic. For instance, what you see over there, that's a print from a uh, 19, uh, 1905 in Jerusalem of what is called the gate of the mitzvot, the precepts, in which the Rizal is explaining, we're going to learn from it, step by step, all the precepts, the Kabbalistic, deep, spiritual, mystical meaning behind those uh, rules that are mentioned in the Torah and explained in the Talmud and uh, whatever. Uh, here is the, the page starting Shara Mitzvot from the manuscript. Okay, and let us just one of the uh, paragraphs begin, beginning in the beginning of the uh, this book of Rabbi, of 
basically it's the teachings of Rabbi Ashla, of Rabbi, uh, sorry, Rabbi Azakloria, but the person who wrote it, that was Rabbi Chaim Vital, but it was not his teachings. It was the teachings of the Ari. And let, let's study. Because if you want to connect to the soul of, Rabbi, of a righteous person, especially something, someone so great as the Arizal, there's nothing like learning his own words. He teaches that. When you learn his own words, you bring his soul in to help you to understand, to study, and to apply. So if you want to connect to the soul of the Arizal, you simply study from his books. You want to connect to the soul of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you study the Zohar. And that's the way it is. So we learn it from the Arizal. Here is teaching. Gamda, you should know. Ki Ha'osem Mitzvah, whoever, any person who is performing a mitzvah, en maspik lo v'mash yaseh otam. It's not enough just to do it. To do it. The, the, the action itself, doing it right, as it says in the books, that's not enough. We know from the ancient sages that they said they said whoever is performing a mitzvah one mitzvah he's going to have uh, he's going to that's going to improve his life that's going to elongate his life also many other stuff that they said this mitzvah gives you this, and this mitzvah gives you that. But we saw a lot of cases. People, they follow the rules, they follow the mitzvot of the Torah. And we see with our own eyes, it doesn't help them. We don't see they get any reward for what they did. Even in this physical world, it should be rewarded. Aval, hashoresh hakol nishan alav, the root that everything in this case is built upon, hu shebaasiyat ha-mitzvah al yachshov shiyalav kemasa. When you perform that mitzvah, that precept, that order of the Creator, written in the Torah, do not regard it as a burden. Like you have to do it, what can I do? I have to do it, God told me to do it, to do it. so I'm doing it, and I'm, and I'm, and it's like a burden that you really can't wait to remove that burden from yourself, so you, to set yourself free. If you do it, don't expect any results. But you have to think with your mind. You have to think that when you do this mitzvah, you have to imagine that will earn you thousands of thousands of golden coins. And you should be very happy performing that mitzvah. Endless happiness. From heart and soul, with a lot of desire. You should be happy like you've been given millions of golden coins at that moment. If he does that mitzvah. Because that is the explanation of the verse of the curses from the book of. Uh, Deuteronomy, with all the curses, Why so many curses? Because you did not serve the Lord your God with happiness and with a good heart. That's what it says in the Talmud about Rav Bruna, that one day he did one of the mitzvot, he prayed in a way that was really smooth, he did not stop laughing the whole day. He was so excited that he did it right. And that shows that you trust your God, your Creator, with the ultimate trust, that you know that you made the right thing and you are connecting to, the, to greatness, even though you cannot see anything. Physically. 
או כפי גודל שמחתו באמת ובטוב לבב הפנימי. And according to the greatness of your happiness, the tr- with truth and good heart, inside, inward, כך יזכה לקבל אור עליון. According to your excitement and good heart, that is the reward of the divine light that you're going to receive when you perform that mitzvah, and the purpose of doing the mitzvot is to receive the divine light. Otherwise, the sages are saying, what does God care if we eat kosher or not kosher, if we, uh, if we are honest or not, if we steal or if you murder or not, what does he care? It doesn't change him. No, when we perform the mitzvot with excitement and happiness as a way to serve the Creator, we have to have certainty that the divine light is coming to us because that, those mitzvot, these are the physical tools to connect and bring in the divine light. Vinyat mitbaze. And when a person is going to be persistent with that behavior, there's no doubt the Holy Spirit will dwell over that person. And this issue is applied to all the mitzvot. When you study Torah, that should be also with a great uh, craving and passion. With excitement. Like he's standing and serving the King Almighty by himself. To find grace in his eyes. Because when you do that mitzvah, perform that mitzvah, you do it in order to receive God's light. Because otherwise, why should you do it? That's an example about the way of the Ariza, which means now every mitzvah that he's teaching in the book of the mitzvot is explaining what is behind that mitzvah, what kind of spiritual light you're connecting to and how that's being activated by performing that mitzvah. Another book that is very, very famous is the book of reincarnations. By the way, there are two of them. There's this gate of reincarnations and the book of reincarnations. Okay, of course, the gates is a, it's a gate, introductions, and the book is more detailed. That, that one was uh, printed in uh, 1684 in Frankfurt, Germany. Okay, the gate of reincarnation. So let's start from the gates. Uh, gate number three. And we find out that when a person is reincarnating to this world, the whole soul is incarnating with all its parts that is teaching us uh, the soul is modular is made of many many sparks the same way the body is made of many organs but this incarnation that particular incarnation we are talking about is only related to that part of the soul that is being corrected in that physical body. Okay? And that is what the whole uh, reward and punishment is dependent on. The other parts of the soul that already have been corrected in previous incarnations, they they share the reward, but not the punishment. Why? Because they were corrected already in past lives. They're not here to suffer, to pay, and to be punished. Because if that person is committing a sin, what the part of him that is responsible for that is not those parts of the soul that already corrected in previous lifetimes. They're not capable of making mistakes. Only that part of the soul that came to that body to correct, that is the only one that has the free will 
to sin or to correct and receive the reward. והנה, כיוון שהנפש הזו בכללותה סובלת עתה ייסורים ועונשים. Since that soul right now, in its whole, is suffering the pain and sorrow and the punishments for this body as it's alive, מלבד מה שסבלה כבר בגופים הראשונים, על ששר ניצוצותיה, גם סובל את צער המיטה הזו. The whole soul is also experiencing the sorrow of that death of that body, and the pain and sorrow that is coming after death. And by this, the early sins are being atoned. Okay, again, the sparks that already corrected in previous lifetimes, they do not participate in the pain because they don't have to. ואומנם המצוות שעשתה בגלגולים הראשונים, however the מצוות, it did, properly in the previous incarnations, וגם המצוות שעשה זה הניצוץ עתיים, also the מצוות, the corrections, the dead spark of the soul that came to correct, did in this lifetime, יש לה חלק בהם כנזכר. אוקיי, okay, it has a share, it shares it, the whole body and the whole soul is sharing it. ועל ידי כך נשלמת איכוניה ושלמותה. So the soul is being repaired and fixed stage by stage, one lifetime, lifetime after another. ואומנם, אם הייתה נוטלת חלק גם בעבירות שעושה התג זה הניצוץ, why is that important to know? Because let's say if a person comes to reincarnate, and every time he will, uh, when he has an opportunity to sin, he would sin with all his sparks, לא היה לעולם שום תיקון על הנפש. There will never be a hope for תיקון in all the incarnations of the world, or בכל הגלגולים שבעולם. כי לעולם אדם חותם, עושה פשעים על חטאיו הראשונים. Because whatever you fix, you corrected, you will mess it up. No, whatever you corrected completely, you cannot destroy it. You can only sin over Parts of your soul that did not finish the correction yet. Those parts of your soul that you corrected already, that is irreversible. You cannot mess it up, otherwise humanity has no hope whatsoever. אבל כיוון ששחר כי הנפש אינם נוכלים חלק ברשעת הניצוץ הזה אלא בזכויותיו, נמצא שעבירות נשלמים להתכפר ואינם מתווספים. So, anyway, slowly, slowly, lifetime after lifetime, You can only move forward, you cannot move backwards. והזכיות מתחדשים ונוספים, so all the merits, they are being added up, one lifetime after a lifetime, one spark of a soul after a spark. ועל ידי כך יש סיום על בחינת הגילוי, and by this, that soul will be corrected with its incarnations. והנה על דרך זה נשלמת הנפש בכל ניצוצותיה על ידי הגלגולים עד שישלמו להתגלגל ולתקן כל הניצוצות מראש הנפש ועד רגליה. All the levels will be corrected that way, stage by stage. And the same thing, the soul, the general soul of Adam, because the same way it is in an individual that is a soul that is made of many sparks, however you can, a spark of your soul, that you corrected, completed, you cannot destroy it anymore. You, you, your free will is only over stuff that you didn't correct it. So sooner or later, through the trials and tribulations, through all the, what the person goes through, little by little he will be corrected after many lifetimes, but he will be corrected. The same applies with the soul of Adam. או every human being on earth was a spark in Adam. Little by little, stage by stage, spark by spark, generation after generation, more and more corrections will be achieved till finally towards the messianic age all the souls will really close to be corrected. And when finally All the souls will be corrected 
That will be the coming of the Messiah. וכפי גודל שמחתו באמת ובתור לבב הפנימי, כך יזכה לקבל אור העליון. So how much divine light you're going to get according to the happiness and the good heart that you're going to generate, that's how much divine light you're going to get. You see the same theme is running, either you're talking about the mitzvot or you're talking about re, from the aspect of reincarnations. Okay. Uh, we'll go to another book from the Eight Gates. That's the most important of them all. It's called The Tree of Life. Uh, that's a print of Koritz. It's a, that's also many centuries uh, ago. I can't see right now. Uh, the year of tough. Yeah, that's also in during the... Uh, 17th century, uh, that print, uh, in Eastern Europe. The Tree of Life is amazing because the Tree of Life is not about commentaries about the mitzvot, which are written in the Torah and in the Talmud. It's not about the reincarnations, the rules of reincarnations. Uh, they're me mentioned in the Zohar, uh, however, the Arizal is the first one who really created the textbook covering all topics of reincarnation as a science. So you can research his writings and go deep. It's very detailed. Okay? The Tree of Life is about the creation of the universe. Step by step, the whole process of evolution, because... The Rizal is teaching us, like in the Zohar, nothing happened ex nihilo, something from nothing. Like it is written in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the Ramban, the Nachmanides is teaching us, you cannot learn about the creation from the first and second chapters of Genesis. Why? They are just there to give us a background. An idea. It's not about the details, and the details are really totally unimportant the way they're written in. It's only hints about the way it really happened. And the way it really happened, it is the way they describe it. It's like it looks so much like science more than a belief system. It's like a process of evolution, step by step, like physics, like algebra. Everything is explained to the detail. And how did Rabbi Ezekloria know about it? First of all, he learned the Zohar. And he learned many other early sages. However, what the Kabbalists of today are saying, and we see it in the readings, that he simply was able to see it, simply saw it with his eyes. He was describing exactly what he saw. He saw the procedure, he saw the process of evolution of the universe from before the Big Bang, the moment of the Big Bang, and what happened after the Big Bang, till our days of evolution and so on. And by the way, in the, in the Tree of Life, it is very clearly, it says about the physical evolution process from inanimate to uh, vegetable kingdom, to the animal kingdom, to the human kingdom. And if it's even being mentioned in the Ariza, in the Tree of Life, that the monkey is the link between the animal world and the human world. It says so in the Ariza that we're talking again this the 16th century okay and of course he didn't get it he didn't invent it he relies on earlier sources also but he's the one the first one who wrote it such in such a clarity that you can read oh that's we're talking about the theory of evolution there was evolution whoever says that evolution is against uh the monotheistic abrahamic uh, uh, faith 
is an ignoramus. He has no idea. Why? Because if there is one God, endless light, how from one endless light that is all the light of everything, suddenly came out this universe. It didn't come out just like this. It had to go through an evolutionary process. And the Arizal explains it to the detail in the Tree of Life. Whoever studies the Tree of Life with, of Rabbi Ashlag, because still, for people that are not scholars, it's, it's impossible to understand it from the Arizal. Scholars can understand it. So Rabbi Ashlag, that lived in the 20th century, and he said that he had the soul of the Arizal guiding him how to write the commentary of the Zohar and how to write the commentary of the Tree of Life, which he did both, which is a huge, huge project. And then when you study the project of Rabbi Ashlag, you could see how the Zohar and the writings of the Arizal basically are describing the same universe. Different language was still like 13 centuries away from each other. So basically whatever I'm reading, by the way, is Hebrew that was written in the 16th century. Okay? Which if you know Hebrew of today, you can somehow understand it. It's like, you know, it's the difference between today's Hebrew and those days Hebrew is not as the difference between today's English and the English of the 16th century. No, here in English, it's, the difference is much bigger. In Hebrew, it's the same words. The language is more, let's say, poetic. So let's read as much as we can in the time that we have. And by the way, we studied that in the study of the Tree of Life, the Talmud Esos Firot. Whoever wants to join that, the course started uh, some uh, few months ago. You can still join the course. Uh, the link will be underneath. Uh, it's recorded with the text in Hebrew and English and so on. But I'm reading here just to give us an idea for whoever did not study the Tree of Life, which is one of the most amazing texts that have ever been written. Da ki terem shenetzlu anetzalim venivu anivraim haya or elyon pashut memale kol hametziot. You should know that before there was any emanations or any creations, and he's using both verbs, that the emanated beings are being emanated and the create creatures are being created because emanation is one stage of the evolution, creation is another stage of the evolution. Before that, the source of all of that, that and we know source, when we use the word Rabbi Ashlag is teaching us, when I say that A happened before B, I really mean that A is the cause and B is the effect. And that means that A contains B. For instance, the seed came before the tree, which means the tree that could be a huge tree, the size of a building, a tree of thousands of years old, but all the information of the trunk, the quality of the wood, the way it reacts with the climate, with the surrounding earth and water and the minerals, and the way it grows and how it grows uh, the branches and the leaves and the flowers and the fruits, all of that is already encoded, we know genetically, in the seed. So nothing can happen in the tree if it did not, it was not encoded in the seed. So when you say that before there were emanations or creations, there was the divine expanding light filling up all of reality, we know that that endless light, divine light, is the cause of all the created beings all reality and it contains all the information of all the stages that came later on 
This is very important to understand because Darwin's evolutionary theory is very faulty. It's still, there's so many missing links that were never found and will never be found. Why? Because, yes, there was, a, there was evolution. There was an evolution. However, Darwin said that evolution was linear. Here, we learn that the whole information of the evolution was already contained in the seed level before there was any physical appearance of any part of the evolution. Okay? Which means that shows us the evolution was happening on a quantum level. Whoever knows quantum physics knows when a physical particle, an electron, makes a quantum leap uh, from, let's say, one layer to another layer of the uh, uh, shell of the atom, it is already predetermined when the electron moves to the second layer, it is already predetermined how much energy it needs to move to that second layer and how it's going to behave in the second layer. Okay? That is already predetermined and there's no way the electron can go 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 layers. There's no, there's either layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, layer 4. There's no in-betweens. How does the electron know when it should move to the next layer? How does it know how to behave when he reaches the second layer or the third layer, which the rules will be again different? That's called the quantum leap. And that can happen only in one case. That is totally logical that the electron knows, quote unquote, when to jump and how to jump and how to behave. He knows it in advance. Can our logic understand it? Of course not. But, you know, Einstein said, the more you study the quantum physics, the more foolish it looks like. Why? Niels Bohr said, the, the, the father of the quantum mechanics said that, you know, there's no connection between human logic and, and, and the reality according to quantum physics. And that's exactly how we're talking and how the Arizal is explaining reality. That divine light fulfilled all of reality. And then Rabbi Ashlag is saying, but that's before there was any creation. What kind of reality that divine light could be fulfilling? And he answers, you should know that all the souls that were or will be, all of them were in a potential state in the endless, included in the divine light, before anything was created and all those souls were there with all what can happen to them till they become perfect. That was already included, quantum, in a potential state, even before reality that we know took place. But in the beginning, there was no, there was no empty space, as empty air or void, and here Rabbi Ashlag explains to us that when everything was there in that original stage, everything was in total completion. There was nothing to correct, nothing to mend, nothing to fix. Everything, everything was, all of reality, was totally fulfilled with that endless expanding light. There was no head to it. There was no end to it. It was only 
X1 expanding equal light, which is called the light, or and so the light of the endless. Rabbi Ashlag explains to us why endless. Because when we are talking about that original, original primordial stage, it is above time, there's no before and after. Above space, there's no right or left, up or down. It's, and because of that, it includes, includes everything, but our brain can perceive items that have a beginning and end, that have some contour, that have beginning and end in the time level, time frame. But here, there's no time. There's, there are no dimensions that our brain can perceive. And that's why it's called endless. There's nothing there that our brain can perceive. And that's why it's called the light of the endless. And when his desire, his simple desire, wished to create the universes and to emanate the emanated beings and to bring to the light the perfection of his actions and his names that was this cause of the creation of the universes. Okay? What is he talking about? How come the creator suddenly wanted something? And Rabbi Ashlag explains, he didn't want anything. How come the light wants something? We're talking about the endless light. The endless light has no desire or wants. Well, who should give him? We're talking about in, if all the souls were already included in that divine light, okay? All the souls were already included. And what defines the soul then, the creator, is the desire to receive. Why is it that we were created as beings of desire? Because the light is a, the endless light of the creator is basically expanding as a sharing of pleasure and joy, which is the source. That's the source of every joy in the universe. And because the endless light is expanding from the essence of the creator, we have no idea what else we know we, there is in the creator, but we know that the creator projects endless light of pleasure and good, that the Zohar says, whatever good that you can feel is somehow a, an emanation from that original light. However, that light cannot be felt unless you have a desire to feel that light, a desire to enjoy that light. So the only ex nihilo, something out of nothing in the creation is a desire to receive joy and pleasure from light that has no desire for anything because it is the energy of pleasure and joy. However, the first stage is that when the, the vessel was created, the, the souls are a vessel of God's light, when they were created, they were created fulfilled. But as we learn in Genesis chapter 1, when we were created, we were created in His image. And since He is the Creator, and He needs nobody's favors, and He's just a, be a, sharing, a being of sharing, we, the vessel, wanted also to share. We wanted also to connect to the Creator out of not out of, a, out of a gift as it was in the beginning. We wanted to achieve the merit ourselves. We wanted to create ourselves. We wanted to fulfill the, the void ourselves. And therefore, who created the universe? The vessels that the Creator created. He created a perfect, happy, 
fulfilled universe full of happy souls. Those souls wanted to create universe themselves. They wanted to reveal the light on their own as a merit, not as a gift. And that desire to reveal that aspect was the cause of the creation that we know. And when that came up, then the vessel, the souls, all of us, shut down our light, their desire to receive the light. And that contraction, shutting down, blocking of the light, happened in the middle point. The whole universe was just a point. Why a point? It's the only definition of the endless. Only a point has no boundaries. Only a point defines complete unity and oneness. That's called in modern, in the modern uh, physics, singularity. The single point in which everything is one. We're talking about scientists discovering this stuff just in the last century. And here the Arizal is speaking about that middle point. That the whole universe was in a one point without any dimensions of space or time. In that middle, why middle? And Rabbi Ashok explained, the middle is what connects the edges, which means the light and the vessel in our logic are edges, the opposite to each other. This one shares and this one receives. But the reality before the Tzimtzum, the contraction was one point. The moment it's bigger than one point, there's already separation, it's not unity. And after that contraction, the light has been withdrawn because of our choice. And then, then there was a space, a space to build, to create, to achieve, to share. And that's how the creation started. That is the, the primordial stage before what we know in physics is the Big Bang. Of course, I can't continue forever. This study, what we just covered, we have to, it's being covered in the study of the uh, Talmud Esasfirot over a few weeks. Uh, here's the in introduction to Rabbi Chaim Vital's manuscript that was written in the 16th century. I, I took that picture of the original manuscript. It was many years ago, so it's the, not such a great... Uh, uh, the, the phones, the smartphones at that time, I don't think there was smartphone at that time. No, but it's before smartphones. Uh, okay, uh, this, this is another example of a, a 16th century print of another book uh, that's a later. Basically, we can go on and on, but you just invited to study more. As I said, the study of the original teachings of Rabbi Ezekluria, you can find them in the bottom, the, the link, the bottom of that, this, uh, this video. And I hope we'll have a great celebration of Rabbi Ezekluria's uh, teachings because these are the teachings of the Messiah. Thank you so much with blessings for a fruitful study.